for his glory. We exist uh, to give him honor. We exist uh, to show forth his praise. Hallelujah. Uh, to, to be a, an acknowledgement of who he is and uh, what he has done. Hallelujah. We thank God uh, for our evangelist Alan for that uh, wonderful uh, praise and worship selection. Hallelujah. We thank God for all of you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All of you, hallelujah, that are joining us on uh, uh, Facebook Live. We thank God for all of you here in the sanctuary. Uh, Time is moving. We are at the second Sunday in February. Today is the 11th of February. Uh, it wasn't, I still have a vivid memory of, you know, bringing in the new year. Uh, time is moving and therefore the people of God must redeem the time. Uh, uh, two quick announcements. As always, our offering basket is here in the front. Uh, we invite you, uh, we encourage you to give as you are blessed by the Lord on today. Uh, we thank God for our evangelist Island who has uh, put together a flyer for us. I, when I woke up this morning, I, uh, uh, the only thought that I had was, okay, I want to add a, a nice background picture for the, uh, for, it, for the words to go on top of it, uh, and then our flyer will be complete. So. About one third of the things that we have been uh, working on and desiring to do will be complete. So we we thank God we're moving. We're we're going ahead. Uh, I will endeavor, uh, you know, not before the day is out, certainly before next Sunday, to have all of the messages that we've been preaching since the start of this year. Uh, you know, because you can find them on Facebook Live, but we're gonna upload them and put them on our YouTube channel so that they're in a nice convenient spot uh, to uh, to go back and to access all of them that uh, that way you can look at them at your own time uh, um, and at your own uh, at your own leisure we are continuing our journey through the Bible uh, and of course our journey journey through the Genesis the first book of the Bible uh, if you have your Bibles, of course, let us go to the fourth chapter of Genesis. The fourth chapter of Genesis. Uh, a little bit of, of shorter uh, passage that we'll be looking at today. We're only going to be looking at the first seven verses. Uh, but there's a, a lot that we can unpack in these seven verses. And it's a, a very important concept to, to understanding, you know, really the rest of Scripture the book of Genesis, to understand uh, really uh, what God did, to understand the promise, to understand our need of salvation. Uh, so Genesis chapter 4, verses uh, 1 through 7, and uh, we're using, uh, we're testing out a, a different translation, uh, so today we're using the English Standard Version of, uh, of the Bible, the English Standard Version of the Bible. It reads for us, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is couching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Today, uh, as we continue our journey, if I had to give a topic to our message today, it would be this, Cain and Abel, an issue of heart. Cain and Abel, an issue 
apart. Now, Father, we thank you, God, for the honor and the privilege of being in your house today. Father, as your word goes forth, oh God, I pray that I might decrease, oh God, that you might increase. Let it be all of you, oh God, and none of me. God, only anoint these lips to play to speak forth your word to this thy people, oh God. And let it walk with power on the unction of the Holy Ghost. And God, let it fall upon good soil, that your people might be edified, oh God. And, oh God, that you, that we might get the good view, God, that you might get the glory, oh God. Yea, God, you will let me be the first partaker, oh God. And, and God, we again pray, oh God. And, oh God, that your word goes forth. Goes forth, O oh God, that one would come to salvation, O oh God. Yea, another would be delivered, O oh God. One more would be encouraged, O oh God. One would be convicted, O oh God, and repent, O oh God. And all would be drawn unto you, O oh God. Father, we thank you. We ask these mighty blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Cain and Abel, an issue apart. Now, at this point in the story, uh, Adam and Eve are outside of the garden. As we talked about over the last two weeks, uh, man, uh, and we are using the strong word because it is appropriate, uh, man rebelled against God in the garden via his disobedience. Uh, we talked about how God has given Adam and Eve every good thing. Uh, in Genesis chapter 2, we are told that uh, when, when God planted this garden, that every tree was pleasing to the sight and it was good for food. Uh, the only thing that Adam and Eve were not to do was to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, but we know, of course, in Genesis 3, 6, that uh, when Eve, uh, ha having been deceived, she looked at the tree and saw that it was pleasing to the eye and that it was good for food and that it was desirous to make one wise, she took of it and ate and she gave it to Adam and he ate. And the scripture tells us that their eyes were open and that they knew that they were naked. And so of course last week uh, we discussed the, uh, the judgment that came down upon Adam and Eve uh, because of their sin. Uh, uh, we know, uh, we're told that uh, Eve was to be greatly multiplied in her sorrow. Uh, because uh, in childbirth, uh, because of her sin, and we talked about how her desire will be contrary to her husband, but he will rule over. And we went into that meant we uh, before that, because chronologically the serpent is cursed first. Uh, we talked about the curse of the serpent, and the fact was highlighted that it actually doesn't say man and, and woman were cursed; only the serpent was cursed. Uh, the man and woman were judged, and. Uh, of course, Genesis chapter 3 ends with God saying, uh, They have eaten of the tree and have become like us, knowing good and evil. Uh, now let us drive them out of the garden, lest they take of the tree of life, and they live forever. And so they were driven out of the garden, and a cherubim was put at the entrance of the garden, uh, with a sword going about every way to block their entrance. And so, of course, man was driven from the good thing. Man was driven uh, from the presence of the Lord. We had talked about Eden as a type of tabernacle, a place where the Lord would come and meet his people. And so here we are in Genesis chapter 4, outside of the garden. They're in a place where all, that the, all the good God gave them has been lost. Uh, because remember we're told now that they have to till the ground and that's got to bring forth thorns and thistles because the ground was cursed because what Adam did. Uh, we're told that uh, no longer is there access to the Garden of Eden, meaning no more is the presence of God normative. That, that fellowship has been uh, broken and you know there's no, long, there's no longer God coming down in the cool of the day to dwell with his people. Uh, their death sentence has been pronounced. They're still living at this point, but they shall die. And of course, the curse of the ground is in effect. But thanks be to God that all was not lost. As we looked at Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 24 on last week, we looked and we took hope in the fact that amidst the judgment, hope was given. 
Genesis chapter 3, verses 15, see, uh, God, when speaking to Eve, said, uh, I'm going to put enmity between your seed. Excuse me, he was talking to the servant. I'm going to put enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman. Uh, so he's going to bruise your head and you'll bruise his heel. You will wound him, but he will defeat you. Uh, we highlighted how this is, you know, the scholars call it the proto-evangelium, the, uh, the first good news, the, the first uh, giving of, of a gospel message. Indeed, it is of the first messianic prophecy talking about Christ coming. Um, and we highlighted that it's also signifying that there, there shall be a battle between those who would live godly, those who are godly, and those who are not. The, uh, the children the seed of Satan, and we understand that Satan doesn't have children. Demons aren't his children, but those whose father are the devil, mm -hmm. uh, to use words that Christ is uh, used in his gospel, in uh, the Gospel of John, in the 8th chapter, uh, verses, those who would be the children of God. And either the demon was going to come and he was going to restore that relationship restore that fellowship, but we would be able to be in the presence of God, uh, to have a relationship with God. But in the meantime, humanity is beginning to spread. And, of course, sin is spreading as humanity spreads. And that is the point where we pick up in our story. Now, by way of background, uh, one commentator puts it quite bluntly when he says this. This chapter, being chapter 4, shows us both how, shows us both how the sins and disorders of Genesis chapter 3 extend outwards in history to subsequent generations. And also that sin, which is expressed in person terms in the story of Adam and Eve, also has a social dimension. Sin has now become a fact of human nature. We uh, are now sinners is the point. And today we are sinners. It is a part of our nature. It is our default state from birth. Uh, we briefly last week touched on the, the idea of uh, imputed sin. How uh, God, the sin of Adam was imputed all, to all of us. That's what was explained to us in Romans chapter 5, uh, starting at verses 12. Uh, uh, and therefore, we all have need of a Savior. Uh, we, I don't remember, we highlighted this, but those who would argue with, against such a thing, uh, then you, you cannot say, well, it's not fair for uh, Adam's sin to be imputed unto us, but then how can it be fair for, because of the act of one man, Christ Jesus, uh, his righteousness is imputed onto all of us. Uh, but sin has now become a fact of human nature. Now we find wrongdoing arising from within the depths of the human heart. Now, uh, it's important to note, if you look at Genesis chapter 3, when Genesis chapter 3 starts, uh, Adam and Eve are innocent. We, we remember from Genesis 2.25 and they were naked yet not exchanged, yet not ashamed, or they were naked but not ashamed, or and not ashamed. Uh, there was no sin that had impacted them. Uh, they enjoyed free fellowship with the God. Uh, uh, they could be open and, and joyous and have fellowship with each other and their creator. There was no internal force that was driving them. Uh, uh, Eve's temptation, Eve, the pull came from without. But now, from that time forth, the pull comes from within. There is, of course, no reference here to an external serpentine temper. Sinfulness has infected the human condition to the next generation. We're going to see uh, next week, uh, because we won't uh, see it in our first verses today, but murder, vengeance, and the corruption of marriage these are themes of Genesis chapter 4. Uh, in other words, we're already beginning to see sin have an impact on what God has done. Uh, God gave to Adam a help me. He said, I will make Adam a help be a helper suitable for him. Uh, 
one that like him is in bears the image of God and his likeness. Uh, and as so Adam made, excuse me, God made Adam one help with Eve, but we're gonna, you know, see Eve in the beginning of polygamy uh, next week as we go through the chapter. Uh, they each had a personal and social dimension and and we're going to begin now here looking at the story of Cain and Abel. And really, as I was meditating on this on the last week, it, it's called the story of Cain and Abel, but really it's the story of Cain. When you think about it, because Cain is the focus of the majority of chapter 4. We have only a few references to Abel. Uh, but we see in Cain... Uh, what the fall has done to the human heart and to the human divine relationship. Next week, again, we're going to see uh, a complete disregard for the Imago Dei, a complete disregard for the image of God. Uh, uh, when we start going through verse 8, probably down to the end of the chapter. Uh, but today, what we're going to look at, we, we highlighted a couple of weeks ago that uh, true freedom is found within the gracious law of God. Uh, the one freedom we t we've been highlighting that man did not have, which was to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, to usurp the sovereign God's role to be the judge of that which is right and which was wrong. Uh, that one freedom, if you will, that they did not have was really the source of all their freedom. They were free from sin. Uh, they were free from death. Uh, they were free to fellowship with their creator. They were uh, free to have dominion over this world to subdue it. Indeed, that was their command. Uh, they were uh, free to be fruitful and to multiply. And they, they still uh, were fruitful and they were multiplied. But they were free from any type of worry. They were free and indeed uh, joyful to depend upon the Lord, their God. Uh, but we're going to see today the loss of freedom that results from being outside of the gracious law of God. And with that, we're going to pick up at verse 1. Verse 1 of our text uh, told us this. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore, us, and bore Cain, saying, I have begotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, verse 2, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. Now, verse 1 is a very uh, interesting passage of scripture. Uh, in studying this out, the, the original, in the original Hebrew language, the, the text is kind of difficult here in terms of what, what did Eve mean when she said, I have begotten a, a son with the help of the Lord. Uh, there are actually a couple of different possibilities that have been suggested. Uh, uh, was it, you know, was she hopeful concerning the promise or was she prideful? Uh, was, uh, was this a statement of faith? Was she going back to Genesis chapter 15? Uh, when, you know, the promise of the, her seed that was coming that he will put, uh, there, there will be everything between her seed and the seed of the serpent. If so, then it would be an acknowledgement that all that, all source of life, or all life comes from the Creator. Now, others have supposed that Eve was acting in a little bit of conceit. What do you mean by that? In other words, she was saying, I have created a man just like uh, Yahweh. Uh, this, this is supported in the craft, in the contrast, because Genesis. And for once, she says, I have begotten a man with the help of the Lord. And, and verse 25, when, uh, as we're going to see, when Seth is born, the, the third son, uh, uh, she has talked about God has given me a son to replace Abel. Not Cain, but Abel. And so uh, the argument is here, she is saying, you know, look at what I did as opposed to look at what the Lord has done. Still something that she believed she had brought forth, the deliverer. In other words, that prophecy given in Genesis 3.15 was now fulfilled in Cain. This was going to be the, per the person that was going to 
uh, bruised uh, the head of the snake and have his heel bruised. So now, which one is it? And looking at the text, uh, I believe the, the fairest reading was that she was speaking faithfully. She was acknowledging the promise, but you know th there was a little bit of pride there. What, what, what do I mean by that? Well, as we'll see later with the story of Sarah, Abraham's wife, uh, what happened there after God gave the promise to Abraham about bearing forth a son? What did Sarah do at one point? She took her handmaid, Hagar, and sent her in onto Abraham, saying, you know, perhaps this is how the Lord's promise shall come. Or perhaps this is how the Lord uh, will do what he said he was going to do. But the fact of the matter is, what we all need to understand and to recognize is that uh, God does not need help to fulfill his promises. Uh, if the Lord says that something is going to come about, it will come about. Uh, if he says it shall be, if it shall be, if he says I will do it, then he will do it. And we don't have to try and help him out. Uh, we don't have to try and say the Lord said this was going to be done. This, this is what I need to do. And he, we often cause problems. Uh, we often make things work uh, when we try and sort of step in and quote unquote help God. Now we know, of course, that it was not uh, the case that uh, Cain was the uh, deliverer. Uh, although he is the focus of the story, it's not even the case that he was a righteous one. Uh, quickly, before we, we, we talk about Cain and Abel, it's interesting. Abel is both a name, obviously the name Abel, but it is a word used also in the Bible for other things. Uh, the Hebrew word Abel uh, means or speaks of vanity, breath, or vapor. And it, you know, it highlights the fact that, you know, in uh, Abel's time was so short, as we're going to see. Uh, Abel comes into the picture and steps out the picture quickly. Uh, there are no accomplishments uh, really listed for Abel. Uh, we're, we don't talk, we don't know uh, much about his life except that he was a, a shepherd. He was a keeper of sheep. Mm -hmm. There does not seem to be a lot uh, done. Although what we do know is going to end up uh, very, very, uh, to be very, very important. So much so that he is spoken about in the New Testament, as we will see in a couple of moments. Verses 3 through 5 of our text uh, tells us that in the course of time Cain brought forth to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat offering, fat portions, excuse me. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. It is in these uh, two verses and the next two where we're going to spend the bulk of our time on today. Uh, first things first, in order to understand the issue and the situation here, because we're talking about a matter of heart or a matter of the heart, what is going on here with the sacrifices? Now, uh, it's important to highlight that the sacrifices, the sacrificial system had not yet been instituted. That's not going to come until we get to the book of Leviticus. That's not going to come till centuries later. After the people of God, they're going to Egypt, they're enslaved for 400 years. Moses is raised up, he is spared from death by the providence of God. And he's raised up as a deliverer to bring the people out, and the people of God are in the wilderness. They are receiving the law, they're receiving instruction. And at that point, uh, beginning in the Bible, in Leviticus chapter 1, where he starts to give the instructions about the sacrifices, about the burnt offering, the guilt offering, the sin offering, the grain offering, you know, the, the, the peace offering, those things that we will go over in their due time. But the sacrificial system at the time of Cain and Abel had not been instituted. 
the receivers of the law would have understood the necessity of blood sacrifice. In other words, when uh, the people of God uh, at the, out of Egypt, they would have been have understanding why it's important. Indeed, you know Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and you know that they would be making sacrifices. Uh, Job, which we know we believe the scholars believe takes place in the uh, the period of the time of the patriarchs, uh, would have been making sacrifices. So, but can we argue? Can we really say that the issue was? Uh, Abel brought a, uh, uh, an animal to sacrifice, whereas Cain brought uh, food. Especially when we have no specific worship instructions given. At this point, there is nothing in the text that tells where God says, this is what I want brought to me. But is it an unreasonable assumption? Not at all. Uh, one commentator states this, uh, Abel's sacrifice involved blood and therefore testified to the death of a substitute. He was coming to God as God had shown he must be approached. When God killed animals in the Garden of Eden and then clothed Adam and Eve with their skin, God was showing that because uh, sin means death, innocent victims must die in order that sinners might be pardoned. Now we will see when we look to the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 1, verses 3, going all the way down to 17, I believe when it talks about the, the birth offering, one of the things that's required is that the man would put his hand on the head, or, or the woman, would put their head on the, uh, excuse me, their hand on the head of the lamb. And that was supposed to signify the transference of the, the sin from that person to the animal. And then that person was slain, excuse me, the animal was slain, and that sin we, we know now uh, from the New Testament, that sin was covered. God overlooked that, and it's only the blood of Christ that washed away all of the sins, but, so therefore the sacrifice is pointed toward Christ. So when Abel came with the offering of blood, he was be believing God and was looking forward to the provision of deliverer. When Cain brought the fruit, he was rejecting that provision. Now that is sound reasoning, it is acceptable uh, reasoning, it, it's rational reasoning. Uh, but one issue is that the word sacrifice, or the Hebrew word for sacrifice actually isn't used in the text. The word that's used for both is an offering. So now the word biblical commentary gives us five different explanations of offer, including the one that we just highlighted here. God favors, number one, God favors shepherds over farmers. Well, again, we're not really told that. And indeed, again, when we look forward towards the sacrificial system, uh, a grain offering, uh, an offering that's the fruit of the ground, can be brought to God. Uh, animal sacrifices preferred over grain offerings. Yes, animal sacrifices, as we'll see, have a higher value. But again, that's not... Uh, that's not laid out here. Uh, this is probably the, the one that a lot of us might choose. So it's the mystery of God. It, it, was, it relates to divine election. And, and certainly while there are other scriptures that more clearly lay that out, uh, that's not really, again, discussed here. The faith of Abel. That's, that's reasonable. God acknowledged, Abel acknowledged and understood who God was, it, they, were, they had to have been told, I, uh, if, if I were to put on my imaginative hat, that they had to have been told why they're there and not in this beautiful garden. You know, you know how they got to that situation. But the last option, and the one that I believe is the best option, is the attitude of their worship. Our, our title today is Cain and Abel, and the issue of heart is the heart of Abel and the heart of Cain that was the deciding factor. It's the heart that was the issue. And they, this is the option that fits the text most. Uh, there was an underlying heart issue. We can't just go to God any old way. Uh, what one thing we'll see uh, is you, when we go into the prophetic books and we, we look at the, the messages and, and the warnings and and the, the, the judgment proclamations that the prophets were given, what was a complaint 
uh, over and over. You know, you're, you're offering these sacrifices, but your heart's near for me. You, you know, the, the, you're, you're giving me these vain words. You're, you're, you're praising me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. When it talk, uh, as it states in Isaiah, I submit to you that Cain's heart was far from God's, whereas Abel's heart was in tune to the Father, in tune to the Master. Uh, the expositor of the Bible commentary uh, states it clearly, where it says, The author's purpose is to use the narrative of Cain and Abel to teach an important lesson on worship. What kind of worship is pleasing to God? Worship pleasing to God is worship that springs from a pure heart. Is that, is that not what we read from our song today? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, as it says uh, in the King's James. Uh, quite simply, Cain's heart was corrupt. This is also the view of the New Testament writings. Uh, uh, Hebrews 11 chapter 4 tells us that by uh, faith Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice uh, than Cain is what we're told in Hebrews chapter 4. First John 3 and 2 tells us that we should not be like Cain who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Jude 11, you know, Jude only has one chapter, so Jude 11, Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. Uh, Cain's heart was corrupted. The issue wasn't uh, the fruit uh, offering in and of itself, but we're going to come back to the fruit offering, but the issue wasn't the fact that he offered fruit. Uh, the issue was the heart behind it. Now, uh, what do I mean? And, and why do I say that? Some commentators have argued that because in Genesis 3, uh, 17, uh, if my memory is correctly, uh, actually it might be verse 19, that, uh, that the ground is cursed because of Adam's sin, and therefore what Cain brought was a, a, a cursed product. But again, we know that that's not the case, uh, because the grain offering, you know, is an offering from the ground. But notice how deliberate the writer Moses is in Genesis. It, it, he told us that Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and the flat portion. Now, what does that mean? He brought God his best. He brought God. Uh, he didn't just give God any old thing. He gave God something that we know later is, is costly. Something that you can get a lot of, of, of money for. This was a sacrifice. Uh, this was giving of something significant. And it's done because Abel understood uh, the God that he was serving. This was, a, this was the creator God. This was a holy God. This was a, a just God. This was a, a righteous God. This was a merciful God. Cain, on the other hand, brought the fruit of the ground. Notice how unspecific that is. Cain brought the fruit of the ground. Well, what kind of fruit was it? Was it the best and the choice fruit? Was it the first fruit that he harvested? Or was it some fruit that was lying around? I submit to you that the, the best reading of the text here is that it was just some fruit that was lying around. Uh, it, it, it wasn't uh, God, it wasn't Cain's choices. It, it wasn't his best. In other words, he could, he could not care or he did not care enough uh, to offer to this infinite, holy, uh, wrathful God uh, what this God deserves, uh, which is the absolute best. Let, uh, by way of illustration, uh, uh, my wife and I recently went out to, uh, uh, to eat on this week. And when we went out, the food that we had was delicious. Uh, the meat uh, that 
I received uh, the lamb in this case was it was choice and, and the service was good. Uh, uh, you knew that in eating it that clearly the chef had and the staff had regard for my wife and I and for the other clients there and they were not content to give us that which was lying around or any old thing. Again, this is what the sovereign God deserves. As we're going to see in Romans, we any old sacrifice is not, is not acceptable to God. And when we get into the Levitical system, uh, you could not offer an animal that had blemish, that had any type of deformity. You gave God that which was good, that which was coursing, uh, that, that which had value, that which meant something. If you couldn't afford the lamb, uh, the, uh, the, the poor of them, you could kill off with doves and whatnot. Uh, but again, it, it, it just wasn't you know, any old dove. It was the best. God deserves that. This is what Cain did not do. Uh, this is not what Cain provided, and therefore God rejected it. Uh, Cain uh, was not showing or demonstrating a, a love for God or, or a submissiveness to God or an understanding of who he was uh, in relation to who God is. Uh, there was an issue with the heart. His heart was not bent. His heart, he was not seeking after pleasing God. His mindset was, I'm going to give God this and he just has to accept it. How often do we sometimes do we do that today? Uh, are, we off, are we always, uh, are we making a concerted effort to offer God our best to, uh, to give him uh, time uh, in worship? Uh, to give him a proper attitude of worship? Uh, to demonstrate reference for his word? Uh, for his holiness uh, to not read the spirit of God that's in us these are all things that we have to uh, consider uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 talk 5 talks about examining ourselves daily to uh, see that we're in the faith but constantly looking at our actions looking at our heart looking at our condition. This was the problem with Cain. Verses 6 and 7 of our text tells us, The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Think about this. Cain was not just anger, angry. He was passionately angry. He possesses the type of anger that kills. One commentator brought up the fact that, you know, in our modern system, uh, as we're going to see next week, Cain would not be guilty of second degree murder, of, you know, the depraved and indifference, uh, uh, you know, this. I know this, 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 I got really, really angry and I, and I, and I decided to, to do this or whatnot. The, this was, we're going to see, this was premeditated murder. And it started in his heart. That's why the scriptures tell us in, in, in 1 John and, and John that he who hated his brother is a murderer. If you have this type of feeling in your heart towards your brother and towards your sister, you are acting no different than Cain. Even if you've never picked up a gun or, or a knife or, 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 or a car or whatever the weapon of choice, to have this type of attitude or mindset is akin to murder. That, that is strong language, but that is the seriousness uh, that is the level of corruption that existed inside the heart of Cain. 
Here in our text, the Lord examines Cain in the same way that he examined Adam and Eve. What is the purpose of your anger? Is your anger justified? Why is your face falling? You know the right thing to do. Will you give in to sin and let it rule over you? If you do that which is right and pleasing, then you can stand before me. This is what the Lord was saying to Cain. And this is the same message to us on today. Cain was personally responsible for his actions. Uh, even if one wanted to make an argument about divine, it does not excuse Cain's behavior. Cain chose to act the way he did. He received a warning uh, from God. You know, if you would do right, you'll often be accepted. But if you don't, sin is crouching at the door. And when you look at that, at the, the, the imagery that's given there is, you know, sin is like a raging wild bull, a raging wild beast, waiting to get in there to control you, uh, to have its way to, uh, to destroy you. What does it say? Its desire is contrary to you. It's negative to you. It's to bring you out a life dominated by sin, controlled, and that's controlled by sin. It's a life on a pathway to death. Not just natural death, but spiritual death. Separation for eternity uh, from the God of creation. This is what the message that God was given to Cain. And, it, uh, and as we're going to see, it is the message that he did not here. Yo, God was one who came, turn from your wickedness. Turn uh, from it. If you if you turn, if you repent, if my people who are called by my name, so humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive your sins and heal your land. That's a very familiar passage of scripture in 2 Chronicles 7 14. The New American uh, Commentary states it like this. By this divine analysis we learn that sin has a pervasive power that seizes occasions to enslave its victims. We've all heard the analogy if you, you, know, if you leave your foot in the door, and if you leave it, it just crack just a little bit it will get in and it will control you. For reference, Romans 3, 9, 1 Corinthians 15, 56, 1 John 5, 19. This is what happened to Cain. So what does it uh, mean for us? Again, we read uh, this morning this, the 24th Psalm, and verses 3 through 6, again say, Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, and who does not look up his soul to what is false or to vanity, nor does he swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Uh, such is, or this is the generation of those that seek him, that seek thy face, or who seek the face of God. Hallelujah. Or the God of Jacob. A right heart is necessary for acceptance before God. We're talk, talking about now what does this mean for a right heart is necessary uh, for acceptance before God. We cannot be living in sin and be acceptable to God. Amen. We cannot be living in sin. I, I am grieved when I go and I look online at the, the Christian posts and I, I see stories of, you know, uh, 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 leaders being set aside because of, you know, adultery or, or fornication or, you know, the, these accusations uh, being made or even leaders being uh, restored uh, even after they've done this without uh, true or, or without signs of true repentance. We cannot be pleasing to God and living all type, any old type of way and expect for him to acknowledge and accept our sacrifice 
uh, acknowledge and accept our worship. Hallelujah. We cannot treat God or the Word of God as an afterthought and be acceptable to God. We cannot offer less than our whole bodies as a living sacrifice. What does this, what did Paul tell us? I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, or which is your reasonable ser service, as the uh, King James says. Uh, if we offer anything less than our whole bodies as a living sacrifice, that is not acceptable to God. Uh, we cannot give God our leftovers. We, he, even as Christ came and he gave us himself and he is the firstborn of, uh, of many brethren, uh, we are, uh, he is to be first to us. We cannot chafe at conviction and be acceptable to God. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11, which quotes uh, Proverbs, tells us, uh, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chases every son whom he receives. Uh, this uh, is another indication of what is wrong with Cain. Cain chafed. He got angry. He got upset at the judgment, at the chastisement of the Lord. How dare you, you know, not accept my sacrifice. So, I, I, um, this should have been good enough for you. You know, this, this, this is not fair. This is a, uh, he was thinking of himself, his own, uh, acting in his own pride, his own self-righteousness, which is as filthy rags in the sight of God, his, his wickedness. If uh, we chase uh, act the correction of God, uh, then we cannot be called the children of God. Uh, it's that uh, simple. Because whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth uh, and scourges you know, his sons. That's what, the, that's what the text goes on to tell us in Hebrews. Hallelujah. Uh, we are saints of the Most High God, we have to examine ourselves daily to see that we are in the faith. As, again, to quote 2 Corinthians 13, 5, hearts bent towards God seek to please Him. If you are not striving to please Him and you bristle at His displeasure or you bristle when you're rebuked by your leader, by your parent, by the person in authority, when you do wrong, it is time for a checkup. It's time for a checkup. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is uh, a message. Uh, this takes us right, really, back to the gospel. As we can see, sin is a heart problem. Sin is an infection of our very nature, of who we are. It has been this way from the beginning, and in, and in and of ourselves, we are powerless to defeat it. It is only the sacrifice of Christ that takes away sin. It is His blood that purifies us. Hallelujah. If you have been listening to what I said, out there in the sanctuary, or excuse me, in here in the sanctuary, or out there on Facebook Live, if you have been listening to our said, and the Spirit of God has brought conviction uh, onto you, or you're, you're, you're feeling the guilt of you're saying, you're looking at yourself and saying, wow, this, I, I see sort of what myself, uh, I see sort of pain in myself. Then I invite you, I call upon you, or I call you to repentance and to faith. Uh, I say to you what God said to Cain, if you do well, you will be accepted. This world is not all there is. Your life, whatever it may be, is not all there is. I call you and I invite you to turn.
turn to Jesus and repent. Hallelujah. To repent. To repent. Hallelujah. And to come to faith. There will be no greater change in your life. I, I call you to Abel and to away from Cain. Uh, hallelujah. I, I call you as, as you as this message is going forth, and it's my prayer that the Spirit of God is, you know, poking at your heart and uh, that your heart of stone is becoming a heart of flesh. That when uh, that you may line up with 1 John 3 12, uh, your works being righteous as opposed to your deeds being evil. And with that I will say amen. And I will say God bless. Uh, we thank God for his word. We thank God for the people of God. We thank God for all of you. Uh, we pray that you have been convicted, that you've been encouraged, that you've been edified, uh, that you've been delivered. Hallelujah. And that you would come to faith. Uh, uh, as always, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you can leave a comment on uh, Facebook. You know, when the videos are posted, you can leave a comment on the YouTube channel. But we thank God for who He is and for what He has done. And we thank God for all of you. Hallelujah.